much for having me, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thirty-seven of them. I mean, thirty-seven of them. 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 Thirty-seven of
email address. Um, that public input, like I said, is vital uh, for good public policy. I know our city council wants to hear it. I know our planning commissioners want to hear it as they begin to go through really the, the formal, final formal stage of an ordinance adoption. Okay, let's jump right in. Any questions before we get started? All right, let's just jump right in. Uh, what, so as we were preparing these uh, ordinances, or we've been preparing them in our discussions, one of the things that we had were some guiding principles, and hopefully what I will present to you tonight will reflect these guiding principles. The first, and this was probably the most common statement I have heard uh, over the last year, is that whatever you do, keep it simple which is easy to understand, easy to follow, and easy to enforce. And so, uh, like I said, hopefully what we are presenting will actually meet that. The second is to recognize that there are changes, and there have been changes, in the VRD industry over the last 20 years. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. The third is to protect the neighborhoods. Um, a VRD, a vacation rental dwelling, is a commercial use in a residential area. And with that, any commercial use, it brings impact to the area, a positive, some negative. And so one of the tasks that we have as we've been working on this is to protect the residential nature of the neighborhood. Uh, the next uh, 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 fourth item is to make it fair. Um, fair to the VRE owners, fair to the managers, fair to the people who live here, fair to the people who come on vacation here to, to make it fair. And then finally, to comply with Oregon laws. Uh, Oregon has some unique land use laws that are different from other states, um, and part of what we want to make sure we do is that whatever is adopted complies with those laws. Okay. All right. Yes? Is there a, a principle or a focus that is economic-related? about creating a tourist destination? The best one that you would have on that is this one right here. Okay. Recognize the changes and also making it fair. Those two go to that and to at the heart of your question. Okay, and we'll get into that right now. One of the things that we did is that we really began to ask ourselves, Richard already knew this. He, he enlightened me as we talked about this. We brought it to the city council. The Planning Commission discussed it. And one of the most interesting things that we found are the location of the VRDs. And the light green that you see here is the R15 zone. Okay? And the yellow is Roads End. Um, a little over 70% of all the VRDs are located in these areas, in the yellow and in the light green. Okay? And um, that's significant. Those are residential areas. Uh, and as we talk, just to make sure, you'll, hopefully you'll see the same thing that we saw as we began working on this. When you have the dark green area, this that follows 101, um, it, uh, that is the commercial areas. And about 88% of all of the BRVs are located in, in the yellow and the two colors of green. Now, one thing interesting to notice is where it sits in relation to Highway 101. It comes up here, and then if you just take 101 and cut it straight up, you can see how it sits in relation to that. The next thing we found was that in all of these areas, which are in the darker and lighter brown, um, there's about 55 uh, VRDs. Okay. That proved to be significant because we looked at that, we really began to prepare the ideas and for the ultimate ordinance change that we're preparing now based on what we found with uh, where the locations of the VRDs. Okay, okay. Uh, so what, we, what we've looked at, what we're proposing is to follow very traditional zoning practices. Things that have been around for a hundred years. I think the Supreme Court first ruled on zoning in the early, um, uh, early uh, about 1920, something like that. It was a California case, if I recall. But anyway, these are practices that are done in every city, in every county in the country, and they're very traditional. I was really kind of excited when we saw this because they, we could use very traditional zoning approaches to, to solve what is really, quite frankly, a complex issue. 
And so we looked at, and by saying that, what we began to look at is, where would you want BRDs? Where don't you want BRDs? And is there something about the market that has told us something? So uh, these areas that you see in the dark brown are areas where VRDs are currently not permitted and where we are proposing that they continue to not be permitted. Uh, they include your park space, your open space, professional campus, planned industrial and marine water and county public facilities. These are zones. And, uh, and so in all the areas that you see in the, this, the darker brown, those are areas in which VRDs currently are not permitted and that practice would continue. They would not be permitted there. The next area is, these area, is this area in light brown. Okay? Um, this is the area where I mentioned there's about 55 VRDs that are located in all of the, in all of the property that's uh, highlighted in this light brown. It's, there's six zones that that represents. There's the R175 zone, the R110 zone, the multifamily residential zone, or RM, the Residential Recreational Zone, or RR, and the Nelscott Residential, or NCR Zone. Now, this is where the Oregon law comes into place. Currently, um, uh, VRDs in a residential zone, in all residential zones except the uh, vacation rental zone, are considered to be an accessory use, which means they have to be incidental and subordinate to the primary use of them. Um, we began asking ourselves the question, okay, is there, are there areas where you could eliminate that provision? And because of some Oregon laws, um, they're, they're, we, we just simply can't eliminate it. But we can define it better. Okay? And in this case, what we will be proposing to the City Council and the Planning Commission is that in these areas, uh, um, homeowners will still be able to get a vacation rental dwelling license, but it will be limited to 30 days okay, uh, per year, not more than 30 days per year. Okay. Any questions on that before I jump to the next slide? Okay. In, as I mentioned, in the light green, or in this green area, which is the R15 zone, that counts for about 36% of all of the BRDs. Um, and so what we are proposing in this case is that uh, in, in properties that are located in these zones, they would be able to operate their BRDs without time limitation. In other words, if, if the, they could operate it for 365 days a year. Okay. And, uh, but it would have an ownership limitation. And that ownership limitation that exists today in these areas, and that is that you can't have ownership or interest in more than one vacation rental dwelling. And so we, our proposal is that we keep that provision for uh, this R15 zone. But we remove the accessory use for the time limitation so people can rent it for 365 days a year. Okay? Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, so that's within that zone, not multiple ownerships, or within that zone, not multiple ownerships. So if a person owned an owner had an ownership in another zone outside of this, that would be the, that would be correct if it is in a commercial zone, and okay, you couldn't have it in two residential zones. So let me before I get to you, let me uh, jump back and say that in this one, uh, you also would have the limitation on the ownership. Um, now, uh, before I come to this, just real quick, again, uh, if you restate that into a statement, such as, I think we should have allowed for multiple ownerships, or I don't think we should allow for multiple ownerships, please send that in an email to, uh, to that address. Yes, sir? What is the rationale for that? For the Limited ownership? Um, do you want to tackle that question? I'm trying to look at something else. What was the question? What's the rationale for the ownership limitation? The original rationale was that in a residential zone, you're unlikely to have your second home, your vacation home, have more than one in the same city in a residential zone. You're, you, know, you may have multiple 
they get a second home, but you might have one at the coast, one on the desert, one in the mountains or something. But you're unlikely to have two in the same city. And the idea of the vacation rental is that it's as an accessory use, it's your second home that you, that your primary <coughs> use is using it yourself, and your secondary use, accessory use, is, is letting others use it. That's where it originally came from. Yes, ma'am. So you're saying it's not okay to have multiple homes in it? In, in this zone, the light brown, and in this zone, that's correct. And there will be one other one that will touch your face. Did you make them businesses now? Aren't they businesses? Well, yes, they are commercial. Uh, they are commercial enterprises in a residential zone. And, and that's, there is a key difference between saying it's a commercial business in a commercial zone and a commercial business in a residential zone. You want to protect the residential nature of the of the uh, uh, of the neighborhood. The short term. The, uh, short the vacation term. rental dwellings is a short term. is a residential. commercial and uh, and a residential zone. Yes, sir. So the the um, would this, the accessories um, definitions apply to these zones? And this zone? In the, in the explanation, you mentioned that it was considered an accessory use, which is the rationale for why you would limit the number of dorm shares. Um, I thought the accessory use provisions applied to the other uh, zones, does it? It's <coughs> not to this, what is it, the R15? Okay, let me answer that. In this zone, yes, the accessory use, which would be defined as 30 days, would apply. In the R15 zone, no, it would not. Now, again, let me emphasize one more time. Behind most questions, there's a feeling. Okay? I like it or I don't like what you're proposing. Please express that in an email and send it to this address. That's the part that's really important. Far more important than, well, it is the most important part is for you to express your opinions by sending to that email. Yes? Where would we, what would you do if you got a question? Um, They're not going to write us back an answer on it. It's like, like a question is, who and why did you come up with a, uh, or a, a traveler's accommodation in the one that city has it? I, mean, I think I've had a lot of customers ask me that. Why, why is Lincoln City so special? Well, we haven't had a problem. With that, why I've had a lot of people ask that if there's a problem, they understand that I haven't heard of any problems. If you want to copy me on that email at my email address, that's fine. Go okay. ahead and do so that. Do um, uh, got but but again, asking. perhaps the more important, well, yeah, if you want to copy me on the email, go ahead. My email address is our chandler at Okay. Okay. Now, in the commercial area, which consists of the general commercial, recreational commercial, vacation rental, uh, the Nelscott Beachside Mixed Use, Ocean Lake Plan, Ocean Front Main Street, and Interior Mixed Use, the Nelscott Business District, and the Taft Village Court, all represented by this green, those are commercial uses. They currently do not have a limitation on time, nor do they have a limitation on ownership, and we are not proposing to change that. So those would continue to remain safe. So in other words, 365 days in these zones, and you can own multiple VRDs. And that would continue. Okay. So the one point that we asked earlier is, the question really was, how can I own two? You can own one in, the, in a residential area, and you can own one or more in the commercial zone. Yes. One more quick question. RM zone, say you have a house, say someone had a house in the RM zone, ocean front, and this went through, once again, they would be instantly drop a 30 day. In, well, so thank you, know, you for bringing to that point. I should have my notes because I missed a couple of things. So let me come back to, let me go back to this one. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, as I mentioned, there's about 55 uh, VRD owners in this area. 
Uh, we also are proposing uh, that there be a prior use exception. Normally that's called a grandfathering clause, so that those owners would not be subject to the accessory use. But in well, the new old then, it's 30 days. Well, those currently, oh, those owners would not be here, except in a limited condition, we'll talk about this in a minute, licenses are not transferable. So that when the property is sold and transferred to another, if they buy it for a license, then they would be subject to the 30 days. Okay. Now, the other part that I uh, also needed to bring up here before we move on, and that is that we are also proposing a cap on the total number of VRDs that would be located in this, in this cell. The cap would be based on the percentage of the number, or, uh, it would be a percentage of the number of lots that are currently available. And, uh, and uh, we will be presenting in such a way that it won't be less than the correct number of VRDs that we have in the city, uh, but it will, it will have some, uh, it allows for some growth. Yes, sir. Has any analysis been done to uh, assess the short-term rental and hotel needs of Lincoln City? So given all the hotels and motels, the utilization of VRD is obviously really important during peak season. So what capacity is needed and what exists today? Part of what we are doing, which Richard is really leading on, are some studies that pertain to the impact of these ordinances on the city. Do you want to describe the studies that you're doing? Um, well, there's one that's probably most relevant to your question is the economic impacts of VRDs uh, in the city, both uh, positive and adverse. And uh, to s some extent, um, probably VRDs have a limited adverse impact on hotels. It's, I want to say it's limited because people in VR, who, who would stay in VRDs if they were available wouldn't necessarily stay in a motel. So they would likely, if they weren't available here, they'd go someplace else. So uh, that's one of the things, and there's, there's several other factors looking at, the employment factors, uh, uh, just general economic impacts, and uh, both positive and negative on real estate prices and that kind of thing. Um, as far as um, whether uh, you know, we, we can, I, I don't think we can say what the demand is for hotel rooms or for VRDs or whatever. I just don't think there's. We can, well, I'll say I don't think I can. Uh, it, it may be possible. I don't think so. I mean, there's there's a certain number of available rooms, and it may be that, that there's a vacancy rate. And, but you know, some some uh, are full all the time, or most of the time. Some are empty most of the time. A lot has to do with location and just how nice they are. Um, so I think it probably is not <coughs> to do the kind of thing that, that I think you're asking about. But we are looking at economic impacts across the board, and also looking at housing impacts and uh, uh, some safety issues and that kind of thing. And I think you're right. I don't think there's an exact way to figure it out. But you would hope that if you if there's some event or something happening in Lincoln City, that you could accommodate all the people that want to be here, whether it's in hotels or BRBs, that mix of available short-term. Uh, Absolutely. Please do me a favor, take that comment, send it to that email address. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is that going to be an in house study or are you going to pay someone to do that? In house. All right. Uh, so, any other questions before I jump to the next slide? Yes, sir. Is the limit applying to all the zones? We don't have that slide on this monitor, so I, I'm not sure which. The limit applies to the R15 zone. Which is really the big VRD zone. He's just not, doesn't have the camera, does he? He's got the camera right here instead of on the. Yeah. Um, in the. I'm going to go see if he'll put it on the slide. So I'm going to be saying when you have oh, he's got there. Okay, we have it. So, so I'm going to step up. So in the light green area that you're seeing, in the light green area that you're seeing, that is where you would have a cap. And it would be on, on the basis 
uh, the number of lots, the percentage of the total number of lots. Now, the other thing to point out on this is that at, at some point, we would probably reach that cap. And uh, at that point, then um, there would be uh, some sort of a lottery type of a thing when, uh, when a VRD becomes, a license becomes available. One of the things that also we were proposing to the city council is that that cap is reviewed on a regular basis. The reason for that is cities are not static. They are living things. They change. And, uh, and uh, we review our other planning documents regularly, and that cap should also be reviewed as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't understand the purchase inside the side. I can't tell you that. Okay. All that you're seeing in the light green, okay, is west of 101. 101 follows, and it's going up right along that border. That's a nice picture of you. Hey, can you come back to the map? The map on the left is the north part of town, and the one on the right is the south. Yeah, they overlap. This is this is Devil's Lake here. This is the same point here. So they're overlapping each other. And you're saying it would be limited in how it goes It would be limited in this area that's light green, the R15 zone. But it looks light green on the right, too. There is a little bit, I'm sorry, there is a little bit that is, is on the right, not a large piece, but there is a little bit that's around the lake. Yes. If you want to come over this side, you can see it there, but you can also see it much easier on the big screen. Also, uh, Rod, when you're pointing with a laser, they can't see I know that. it. So I'm just saying, if you won't want to see what he's pointing at, it might be better to sit over on this side. Yes. Yeah, it's much easier to see on, on this side. Now the north end is still on the map. We're coming to Rosetta in just a minute. Yeah. So let me say it again. So if you follow, let me go back to just a couple other screens. Okay. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So as I mentioned, uh, seventy percent, a little over seventy percent of our BRDs are located in the R15 zone. But you see in this green, and you're right, there is a little bit that's um, east of 101 and Rhodes End. Okay? Uh, uh, about 88% of the VRDs are located in the areas when you add the commercial properties. And then when you look at the brown, either the dark brown or the light brown, um, there's only about 55 of those. Okay? And so. Um, Again, as we discussed in these darker brown areas, this is where it would not be permitted. BRD is currently not permitted, and we're proposing to keep that the same. In, uh, in the, uh, the light brown area, which is represented by these zones, uh, we are proposing that they continue to be allowed, but only for up to 30 days per year. Um, and um, that for the, for the currently licensed uh, BRD owners that they are given a prior use exception or a grandfathering clause that would allow them to continue to rent for 360, or would allow them to get rent for 365 days. The light green on these is the R15 zone. Okay, in these zones, um, we are proposing that there's no limitation on the time. The ownership limitation continues and that there is a cap on the total number that is permitted. Now, if that cap is reached, I mentioned uh, there would be a lottery system of some, uh, some style, but you would also still be able to get the, uh, the license for up to 30 days. The cap is just in this area or it's citywide? It would be for this zone, and then we're coming to Road 10, which is unique, and they just need to be handled separately. I had a discussion. Yes, sir. Someone asked me, is there an access for use on how many times you can write to your in LincolnCity.org? Is there an access you can have? We should limit it. I mean, as you go along, oh. can, you, can, you, can you write as many times, times you want? Okay. Please. If, if you forgot something today, today and you want to write it again tomorrow, please, as many times as you want. Okay. Okay. Um, commercial, again. Uh, no limitation on time, no limitation on um, ownership, and no cap on these. 
That brings us to Roads End. Roads End is unique in that when it came into the city, when it was annexed into the city, it came in under an annexation agreement. And that agreement, uh, one provision of it is essentially that the city will not initiate um, any zoning changes for a period of five years. Uh, we're somewhere around two to two and a half years into that, about halfway through. And, uh, and, and so Roads End is operates under the county zoning ordinance, the R1A county, and will continue to operate under that, um, uh, under that ordinance until such time as the zoning has changed. So we are not proposing to change this right now. Now, there has been a request to go ahead and which change the ordinance, which came into Richard, and he began working on that. But that has been, is now being delayed until after um, uh, we see what happens with the vacation rest as well. So, for the time being, until a city um, uh, zoning designation is adopted, the roads in people, as well as property owners, people who live there, will continue to operate under the county's R1A zoning ordinance. But as it pertains to BRD, they are subject to our licensing ordinances, which we're coming to in just a second. So any questions on the agenda? So was that to say if I sell before the five-year windows up, my license be able to go? To no, licenses are not transferable, but they, but the new owners would be able to apply for a license under the uh, the county's zoning regulation. Okay. All right, the next is the BR zone expansion. Uh, there's one area in town, Olivia Beach, that um, is currently has the BR expansion. It is a residential neighborhood uh, that does allow VRDs as unlimited rental and multiple ownership. Uh, the ownership restriction is not there. Um, because it exists and because properties have been have that zoning designation. We are not proposing to change it. What we are proposing is that we, it, we do not allow a further expansion of the vacation rental zone. For those who, uh, who have property in the uh, currently VR zone expansion, will continue to be able to operate it on, under that. Again, we're proposing that we do not allow it to expand into other areas. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Are there any restrictions in the VR zone other than occupancy? Uh, yes, all of the licensing provisions would be would do hold to this. Okay. Are there other limitations? Number of VRDs, number of days? No. No, then there's not a limitation on the number of days that you can that you can uh, rent, and there's not a limitation on the number of VRDs you can own, but there are some licensing restrictions such as occupancy. All right. Uh, let's move now into some of the licensing provisions. There's three that we wanted to talk about that came into the discussion. The first is overnight occupancy. Um, that's the maximum number of people you can have in your VRD. Um, currently, um, it's based on the size of the bedrooms. Uh, if you have a, you can have a minimum of two for a 70 foot square bedroom. You can get a third one in there if it's 50 square feet larger, and then a fourth if it's another 50 square feet larger. Um, and and, um, and uh, for those uh, homes, BRDs, where the homes were built after 2010, um, there's a maximum number of 16 that are permitted. Okay? Um, we are proposing that that is be changed to being two per bedroom plus one. Okay, so the next, if you have a two-bedroom uh, VRD, then you would be able to get five people who, rent, who, can, who can stay overnight. Um, if you have five, then it would be 11. The other part that we're proposing is that <coughs> children under three do not count towards the um, uh, uh, total number of people that are alive. Okay, let's go over here. Um. We have in our house a den without a closet at a high bed. We've always been able to rent that. 
Uh, I'm going to have Richard answer that question because that's ultimately what he does is answer those questions. If a if a room is is principal use of the room is as is for sleeping, then it's a bedroom. Um, if you have a room that maybe doesn't meet that definition, you want to convert it to make sure it does. So you get those additional two people. Um, you can do that, provided it meets the safety standards and you have enough uh, enough parking because you have, to have one parking space for every bedroom. So if you have like three bedrooms and you've got this extra room that sometimes people sleep in, you want to make it a fourth bedroom. You can do that. It's fine as long as you meet the egress standards, for example. So there's, there's two ways out of the room that, that are of a certain size, and then you have a, a fourth part of the space as well. So it's a height of it, it's a bit of it. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a judgment call. It depends on, again, what the, what, what the principal use of the room is. Okay. Um, and we, we were talking about this in, a, in my part of the staff meeting today. If you have a big room that's got, you know, a pool table and, uh, you know, a couple of the television and whatever else, and there's also two sets of bunk beds in there, what, what kind of a room is that? Is that a bedroom or is it a game room or something? That's the kind of thing we're going to have to work out. Is uh, there a, like, a, a grandfathering portion of this? Because you mentioned that prior to 2010, there wasn't a 16-person location. So now, if you're going to change the cap and say you're already allowed to go up to 16, does that change for you what, if this goes into effect? Right now, we are proposing that it become two percent uh, all of our needs. So what I would suggest is that change that into a statement and send it to that to that address. I, I know that will be a discussion. So please, so please do that. Yes. Well, it ties to your question. Back in 2014, those the new health and safety and all the work that was entailed. I don't know if you were here. But we had a lot of work. I mean, we have copper railings next to our other railings. We have egress windows. We have, we, everybody had to measure their bedrooms. I'm sure that some of those properties in Roseanne that slept 20 or 30 or whatever the heck they slept, th that had to be a huge change for them as a result of that health and safety. So has that really had time to, have you seen an impact from all that? expense and hard work that was done. What made you decide to tighten the, the boat, to tighten the nut a little bit more? No, Have you nice. seen problems after you've made those huge changes? Um, we had uh, a couple of, of houses and roads in. I know them. Okay, you, you know about it. Yes. So, so you know the, and you know what happened. Um, it was appealed and there oh. was their appeal. So. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I. Yeah. Um, as far as like major impacts, um, the main the main impact is for those who had more than five bedrooms. But for those who had you know, uh, you know, five or fewer bedrooms, and that, but that, that didn't meet the safety standards, yeah, there was an impact. From there's no question of that. Uh, the one next door to me had to had to make you know. Uh, cut, cut out part of their foundation to put an oh. egress window in that kind of thing. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's the cost, of, that's the cost of safety. Absolutely. Yeah. But the 16 coming down to that, there are, are some places that are operating with 16 that maybe are doing a great job and, you know, have some groups, women's groups, different people the, coming in. The answer, to, the answer to your question really depends upon who you ask. Okay? Sure. We are not the right people to ask uh, because... I can go to one individual, and we've had that, we, we have this all the time where they say, no, there's no problem. Sure. And our neighbor may be saying, it's a huge problem. Sure. So when you ask that question, what is the problem, the question really depends on who you ask. Sure. You know, because some people say, no, there's no problem. Others will say, there is a major problem. I just didn't know if you'd given that enough time. I mean, that was a pretty big, you know. Especially if people came down from like 28 to 16. Yeah. And had you given that enough time or felt the need to just two years later or less than two years change it again? Very good and very valid point. <laughs> you guys got this one down. Please send it to that address. Yes. I'll send mine to that address too. 
they just helping me understand a little bit here. So I currently have a three bedroom. We have we limit currently at eight. So under this we have to limit at seven. Yes sir. So the height of beds in the living room. Uh, two people currently sleep on it. I, I, I would just I mean it hasn't hasn't been a problem. There's like ten BRDs in a row. I'm in the middle. I can tell you my neighbors are um, having any issues. I, 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 and eight for us seems to be a bad. Because that information is critical for the planning commission and the city council to hear. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we do want to know how to pass. I'm <coughs> my property manager got got to regulate for three or three or younger. I mean, yeah, are we gonna well, stand at the door and check their ages? And I mean, so that comes to a little bit of enforcement, and this just doesn't apply to BRD. This applies to enforcement across. The Across the board, um, a, a lot of the way the city enforces, enforces things is by complaint. Sometimes it's by observation. We have people that are going through the neighborhoods; they see something. You see that, especially with things like parking, where they see a violation and then they deal with it. Um, but but a lot of times when we get complaints, especially on the areas that we call nuisance like nuisance violations. Um, uh, we, we will receive a call from somebody or an email or a letter complaining about it, and then we go investigate it. Uh, that practice is very common. It's one that will continue. Um, uh, and so uh, that's, that, uh, that's, we also will be looking on how you're advertising. Uh, if, if you have three bedrooms, and which limits you to seven, and you're advertising for 16, then we know there's a problem. <laughs> you can deal with it. I understand that, but do give us some. Thought or latitude relationship. I mean, we're talking one individual. We're talking, well, unless you have, you know, three year olds, you keep that. I mean, it, uh, <coughs> and I have a response to that. I think sure. I'm a responsible homeowner. Um, you know, I would regulate this as closely as I can, uh, but uh, I never stood at the door and checked. I understand that. Yeah, and and I, I should be liable to be cited if, if so. Um, yeah, I know you know this, but please send it to that information that and to that address. Very important. Okay. We talked about the single ownership again in the um, uh, the residential areas that we've talked about. There currently is a single ownership limitation, and we are proposing that that continues. It would not. Uh, it would not exist for the vacation rental zone and the commercial zones. Okay. And once again, if you have existing, uh, if you, yeah, it would, it, there would be a grandfather clause. Yeah. One, one last question: Was Newport two plus two plus one or two plus two per two? bedroom plus two? That's what I thought. So we'd have one of the most restrictive in the state. Then. Yeah, well, I don't know. I have to look at everyone. I would look at the coast. It would be the most restrictive, I believe, what it is. I, I, yeah, like a lot of them are three per bedroom and two plus two plus two. Uh, that's just a proposal, right? That's what is being proposed right. to the city council. They will then take it uh, and work with it from there. Uh, transfer of license. We are proposing a limited transfer of license uh, upon the death of the owner of the VRD. Where um, yeah, it would, uh, the license would transfer for up to a year or until the property is permanently transferred uh, to someone else. And, uh, and the, the one exception on that is that if, if, if the estate is, uh, is uh, if the transfer is in the name of a the spouse, then they would be able to continue to operate on that. But if they were to transfer it to somebody else, um, that license. Would not be transferable, um, uh, and, and and we would allow to, to continue to transfer for up to a year or until the property is transferred. I said that very important. So does that make sense to everybody? What I said. Okay. So this spouse uh, of family trust. I'm going to let Richard. If it transfers to a spouse, domestic partner, family trust, or trust in which the owner was uh, uh, the beneficiary of the trust. It can continue. The idea of this, of the transferability uh, for the year, is if it goes to an heir, other.
other than a spouse, domestic partner, partner and so on, or an, or an executor or something. They, they've got a year to, to keep running it because chances are uh, they've, they've made re accepted reservations and that kind of thing. So they can keep going for a year or less if it's sold to somebody else, then that new owner would have to apply for a, a, a license. I have a question on the transfer license. Okay. So just, just to, I guess, it's okay. uh, operate in full, or is it, uh, are you just taking those reservations that you've already had? So you'd be able to up, up, take be able to continue to operate under that yeah, license. Originally, the thought was you could, you could, you could, you can only use the reservations you already have. That seems pointless and unenforceable. So you've got that year. I guess, and I know I'll get the same right <laughs> up here, right to the VRD. But I guess, Gene, if, if you're an operator and the house burns, what happens to those uh, reservations that were made in the bank? So they, they get refunded their deposit. Yeah, you yes, could. You can find them somewhere you, else. The property, if you have a property manager, but if you right. don't, right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, you're talking about we're in a lot of fires to be equivalent to a lot of houses selling over the years, and it could make a bad name for the town because all these people would get online. Everything's motivated by online reviews and comments now. That's like the factor control. It's a joke to I me. Mean, if you had a problem with rats, you would. You would get sued online, it would be like the sandwich shop that had the rat and the sandwich down there. You'd be done for it. You know what I mean? So uh, if, if someone starts saying Lincoln City, you would, don't be careful or rent there because if they change ownership or someone dies, you, you, you're, you're, you, 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 you're, all your plans could be ruined. And that's a bad image to have, I would say. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is prior notification of the licensing. Right now, when um, Richard issues a license, <coughs> we send out a notice to uh, all the properties within a certain distance of the VRD, uh, informing them that a license has been issued, and also informing them how they can appeal the decision. We're proposing that uh, the notification uh, uh, is to be sent prior to the decision being made. So if somebody wants to send in a comment about a, uh, the proposed license, it, will, it can be done before uh, the license is issued and which can take into consideration their confidence. Okay. Uh, the, the next one is that um, we are proposing, we look through the Oregon Health Authority Traveler's Accommodation Rules. Those are the rules that pertain to operating a hotel. And uh, we looked at are any of those applicable to, um, to the RDs and we found two. Uh, the, the first one is under vector control, which is bugs and rats. And the second is under the rules pertaining to the spa and swimming pool. Uh, and what I would suggest is <coughs> these uh, slides are on our web page. I checked this morning. They're, they're there. And the, that email address is linked. And so if you go in and click that email address, it will take you to the state's um, uh, uh, traveler's accommodation rules. And these are the numbers of those rules. Okay. Like I said, I checked this morning, the link works, so please go to the web page and look those up. It's very interested in knowing what you have to say about that. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I think I need to look harder. Um, are, will you pick and choose the rules? Because um, point. for Bromine, it, it was an hourly check or a continuous reading device. Um, if you had chlorine, which I think probably some people still use, non-stabilized was hourly monitoring. Um, stabilized was every two hours. So do you go in and do those things? And it right, now the the guests? right now the proposal is to simply adopt those. If there are provisions that you find that don't work, yeah. um, suggest maybe that they yeah. pick and choose. Yeah. But now I might say that when it, you're dealing with spots, yeah. a hotel has to a hotel has to meet these currently. These are requirements that are made for hotels right now. Would that be? I noticed that some of the decking too, the tub was maybe 
I think there was a requirement of so many inches above the decking. Would that be for handicap accessibility? Then? That reason? I don't know the answer. You know? to that. I don't know the answer. To that question. Um, it's pretty complicated. Okay. Sometimes people don't like you to come and change a light bulb. They want you to wait until after they leave. Yeah. I can't imagine going in there hourly right. with test strips and checking how much they would be like. We're barbecuing. We don't want your person coming in and doing this. Especially, but, especially you know, in October. Yeah, they might be in the. That's a good point too. Yeah. Okay. So I, okay. Uh, but those are the very kind of comments, questions that we we need to have. Okay. Uh, so I'm very familiar with what we do as far as swimming pools because we own a swimming. Pool. Right. You're going to be much more familiar with the stops. Okay. It isn't the difference between, I think I asked one of the county or something, one time is that group that you have is the group you're with. You don't know if you're not bringing someone. You know, like in a rig or in a hot tub, when we were down at Palm Springs, we didn't know who was in with us. We're on a rig or a hot tub. It's usually you're in the family. That's how, why they don't do it at residential. They were saying it's I don't know why the county, there's one group. You know, I don't know why the county has chosen not to uh, enforce this as it pertains to. Lisa, I talked to them also. They said because a lot of houses are compound and fenced in, they have to have it scheduled. And I think some of it has to do with manpower. So. Okay. Uh, under the area enforcement, currently our quiet hours are from 7 uh, p.m. to 7 a.m. We are proposing to change that to 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Okay. Now that one, it's important to note that that doesn't pertain just to BRD. That's a, a citywide change for that. Uh, one of the big ones that uh, we talked about is, and we're proposing is a call center. <coughs> this does not require any changes to our ordinance. Well, it requires two changes to our ordinance, but the implementation of it does not. We could do this actually now. Um, and that's it. When, um, as I mentioned, when a license is issued, we send out notice to the surrounding neighbors, and that includes a, the phone number for the uh, local representative who's in charge of the PRD. Now, in some areas, that means a, a person can get three or four different phone numbers that they have to call. Um, one of the things that we heard quite a bit was that we really don't like. Um, having to try to keep track of who we have to call. Yes, sir. Just a little bit. Personal anecdote we got our cards in the mail today and got 11. 11? That's so the highest one I've heard so far. I agree that this single number would be. Yeah. So, what uh, we are proposing to do is to use our. Send out 16,000 of them. Yeah. Say that again? We sent out 16,000 notices on Friday. Wow. Okay. Um, so, anyways, uh, so what we're proposing is that we use our current dispatch uh, as the call center. So when a call comes in to dispatch, it would be a non-emergency number. It won't be a 911. Uh, if it is a life safety issue or a noise issue, uh, the police will be dispatched to respond to it. If it is a non-life safety, non-noise issue, um, like say the trash or parking or something like that. Um, the, uh, the dispatcher will send an email to the local representative uh, 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 informing them of the, of the call. And the local and copy the city planning department, the ones that are tasked with enforcing this uh, on, that, on that email. Uh, the Local representative will have two hours uh, to correct whatever that issue is. So the best example I've had is a dog comes over and he tips over the garbage can and then the front just through it and creates a mess. Okay. Uh, call comes into dispatch. Uh, dispatch sends an email to the local representative. They would have two hours to clean that up. Um, our staff would have 24 hours to verify that it was cleaned up it was correct, that whatever the call came in was, was fixed. Okay. That really becomes important as we talk about penalties. So the, the email thing, I mean, I don't think now they capture emails for local representatives, just phone numbers. But I mean, it's not inconceivable that someone wouldn't check their email for a couple of hours. So 
and I can I'm happy to send an email up to that uh, address there, but it may be more than just a, a email and a phone call if someone has to respond to two hours. Okay. Thank you. I've got a question. How do you guys address a second homeowner that was down on a weekend that puts his garbage can out, mandatory garbage? Uh, if anyone lives in town and you put that out on Monday, pick up some Monday and it blows over a rack and gets in. How do you guys address that? Not to get up if it's not a VRD? Yeah. Um, same, same way. There would be a call that would either come into Richard's office or to the dispatchers, um, and uh, we can ask somebody to go out and to look at it. Oh. Well, uh, in the case of a BRD, yes, there would be a two hour. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, going back to the licensing slide right before this, is there is there any, any discussion about the cost of the license since now not all BRDs or what's proposed, not all BRDs are like credit equal? Would they all have the same? Uh, Cost to do them again. The right now, we are not proposing any changes to the licensing. Okay. Or the, the licensing costs. Okay. All right. The next is in the area of enforcement. Uh, for me, this is actually one of the most difficult things that we have, uh, and that's going to be one of the most expensive. The long term one is how do we deal with parking? Because parking is not just a BRD issue, we have parking issues all over the city of which VRDs are one contributor to them. Now, one of the things that we looked at and the proposal we're making for a change in the ordinance is the prohibition that we have right now for triple stack. And what that means is that if you can park three cars in a row, we currently prohibit that, even if there's space on the property to do that. I can use where I live, for example. I've got a long enough driveway that I can easily get three cars without it going into the right of way sidewalk or something like that. Um, uh, we, uh, we are proposing to eliminate that provision. Now, they still won't be able to park out, you know, still get blocked in the right way and so forth. But if you can get three cars, we don't want to forget it that. So we're making that proposed change. The other uh, items, and these are just examples of what we're talking about, is more long-term, as we'd love to try to create more parking as we look at new signage, as we look at uh, where people can park, where they can't park, rules for the length of time people can park, and so forth. This one will be an ongoing project uh, that uh, we will be dealing with over the course of the next uh, <coughs> try to try to uh, figure out how to improve the parking opportunities in the system. When you talk about signage, do you mean possibly requiring signs? Or is it um, you can park here or you can't park here? It could be, yes. Um, and, uh, I guess the best answer to that is maybe. Um, depends on the ideas that come up. Um, will they work? Uh, will we allow some limited parking on the street? Uh, won't we allow it? Uh, this one will take a lot more work to it, I think. Councilor? Uh, don't forget to hand over here. So um, the um, uh, so. The, Parking is, is one that's going to really be a long-term issue as we try to deal with it. And it has the potential to be a very expensive issue as well. Yes, I'm going to ask it now because this seems perfect, and I've always had this question. We've had a house for 10 years, and um, we can sleep six. We have two bedrooms in the bed with the rolls of babies in this place. And so we're only allowed to have two cars, one in the garage, one behind the garage, no street park, right. which really limits, you know, three cars with how many wheels around that. Um, so how come when we come down and we bring our kids, we can park in the street? That's an that's, that's a very good question. I mean, it just doesn't seem democratic to me. That's a very good question and it's an interesting question, an interesting answer. Currently the parking restrictions on the street is a part of the VRD license not a part of the parking restrictions. So in other words, there's, there are not restrictions in most areas of the city for people to park. Now, I live in a home. I don't have a BRD. Guests come to visit me. They can park on the street. If they come and they spend the night, three nights with me, they can park on the street because I'm not a BRD owner. Um, in the case of the BRDs, the way our ordinances currently work, 
is that you, is that the on-street parking is regulated by the license, which means the VRV owners are responsible to make sure people don't park on the street. How about on the commercial zone? Parking on the street. So I'm going to have to turn to Richard on this question. Uh, well, I believe it's, it's the same. Even the commercial zone. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we have so few of them. So, so I'm uh, coming to your question. So, on a very practical stand, or a very practical, in how it works. Okay, uh, if there is one of the VRD uh, renter that is parking on the street, we do not ticket the, uh, the renter. We contact the owner and say you are in violation of your license provisions. So, how do you know? Um, I mean, when we go down there. So that's one of the that's one of the difficult tasks. That uh, you know, I I can't say it any other way. But that's one of the difficulties we find in being in So I just want to give you a kind of a crazy example. Our son, uh, who is not a renter, spent the night there last night. And we were getting in the garage door, and he was in. Right. And so I told him, "Well, you can park there, but you have to park there behind the garage. That's the those are the city's rules." But as soon as a garage door man comes to replace a garage door, you can't park here, you're, but you're going to have to park in the street, you might be in violation. And so, I mean, it's, it's really crazy. I just wish... That's one of the, that's one of the, again, to me, when you look at the long term, I think parking is probably our most difficult issue that mm -hmm. we're going to continue to, have to deal with. And the reason is that it's not just a VRD issue. We have parking problems throughout all the city. And uh, I mentioned in our presentation last night that uh, one of the things we <coughs> love about Lincoln City is the fact that we have narrow asphalted roads and we don't have curb and gutter. It makes a very quaint, beautiful little community. But at the same time, that creates parking problems. And uh, and, uh, and so like, uh, this, this one, like I said, there are whole bunch of solutions out there. Each solution has its benefits and its drawbacks uh, as we go forward in working with the City Council. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing multiple ways. Yeah. Yes, I, to address that, I think that that means you can, you can park an extra car now. You can be in the garage, up to the garage, and one car beyond, not triple stacking, but you'd be double stacking. You'd be able to well, have another car I mean, there. I think is an, an unusual situation. Yeah, because we are in an area. I can't even explain it. Yeah, down the street. Yeah, it, it's um, down in Nelson, where it goes down where you can walk down on uh, the trail, and there's a lot of asphalt there, and uh, the city won't allow anyone to park there. It's considered public, but no one in the public would ever park there because it looks like it's our property. So if we double the staff, then we're out in what's... You safe. encroach on that? Encroach on we depend on the vehicle size, huh? Um, oh, period. Yeah. Encroach. Okay. So the only proposal we're making at this point in time is to eliminate the triple stacking restriction. The rest of these, all that you're talking about, we know we have to deal with them, but it's going to be long-term, and they have the potential of being very expensive as we try to, uh, to work through them. Okay. Uh, the next thing we want to bring up is enforcement. This is one that um, uh, comes back to our discussion on the trash. Uh, um, <clears throat> we've heard a lot over the last year of you know, just talk about Newport has. Um, well, Newport has <coughs> a very onerous uh, uh, enforcement of penalties. You get three strikes and you're out. Okay. If there's a complaint, you get a warning. If there's a second complaint, you lose your license for 30 days. If there's a third complaint, your license is revoked for the remainder of the license period, the remainder of the year. Um, as we talked about this with the city council, what they want to look at is whatever the penalties are associated with it, it is for verified complaints. So, for example, the dog comes in, kicks over the trash, uh, we uh, the email gets sent out, the local representative comes in and cleans it up, gets it done, and fixed within the two hours. 
that will not be subject to a penalty. If they don't, then it would be. Okay. Um, so, but the, you know, the, the real theory behind it is that we recognize that there are sometimes circumstances that happen. We want really people to just take care of the property. Uh, so if, they, if they've taken care of the problem, then, uh, especially in nuisance areas, uh, then that's not considered as a violation. If they don't take care of it, then it will be considered as a violation. The other areas that we're looking at right now is also in the area of penalties. Um, right now, all penalties are associated with, uh, they're considered to be uh, uh, class A infractions, uh, which are subject to a $1,000 fine and, and or the loss of a license. And each day, the violation, uh, each day of the violation of current counts as a separate offense. We're looking at something a little bit more tiered on that. Um, uh, based upon what the violation, uh, what the offense is. Okay. Finally, our last uh, slide is public education. Um, uh, again, this does not require any ordinance changes. Uh, we are looking at creating a very active and aggressive public education program that for both the people who live here uh, and the people who visit here, the owners that uh, live here, the owners that don't live here, uh, these would include brochures, um, explaining, especially explaining that you're in a residential area, please be considerate, outlining what the rules are, public service announcements, channel four, um, channel four is to use right now to broadcast these uh, uh, these meetings, we want to use it also as a way to inform people to create public service announcements, signage, and a myriad of other things that will come up as we go through these things. So these ones do not require any ordinance changes, but we want to make sure we have a, a very effective and public and aggressive public education campaign. How much information would be as publicly available about the RDs? Like, could I find out if I called the, your office? Richard and said, oh, is this address a DRD? Like, if someone's buying a house, would they be able to find out if the houses around them have DRDs? Yes. Yeah, you could come and ask, or they could call. Okay, so that's public. Yeah, yeah there, there are some, almost all records <coughs> are available to the public. There are some that are not, or there are some provisions within those records that are protected. So you might get something that has uh, things that are redacted out of it. Uh, or there may be on occasion we say, we say, I'm sorry, you can't have that because it's a protected record out of the so Most of all of our records are public records. Okay. All right. Any other questions? That brings me to the end of our presentation. Yes. I've got a quick statement for Robert. I mean, Richard. <laughs> 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 uh, I just read that. Yeah, so, you know, this whole thing obviously is trying to be sold to the citizens and the VRD people, because if we can't get them all together, it's just going to be a war again. One thing I'd ask uh, Richard, if, if you have any data on uh, how many complaints are here, because there's a perception above myself and other people that things are getting a lot better, you know, and it would be nice to have some numbers. It seems like it's kept secret, you know. Uh, are we getting more complaints, less complaints? We have two complaints a year, a thousand, you know, I mean, some kind of numbers to reinforce yeah, the, I agree that would be wonderful. But yeah, that's not, we, there's a perception that what, there's a problem, but it's, it's, there's problems with everything. The bars are, there's fights, and there's all kinds of stuff that go on there. One of the, of course, one thing that happens, you get your cards, like he's got 11 of them. They don't call us a lot of times. They just call the local rep and just take care of We have no way of knowing about it. Um, a lot of times people don't do anything about it. Their concerns that they have. We, I, I will say that it, since we've been, we've been, uh, say over the last five or six years, um, the kinds of issues that we have to deal with have changed. In that uh, the, the, the egregious violations, I think, are, are are fewer, primarily because they know we're out enforcing them. Right. Yeah, I just meant if you had any numbers or anything, just to... Uh, we you don't, don't. You don't. I, I mean, we, we have some information, but I don't think it I don't think it tells the story. Will they give an idea how many people send in emails and stuff? 
Uh, uh, just got turned out or anything like that. that. But, you know, well, yeah, because like I said, if, if you came to me and said, well, I had, obviously we only had uh, 40 emails, I know it would be more than that, and 39 of them were people that had homes and vacation rentals, and we had one, one local person, right? I'm not saying it's going to be that, but again, it's selling the perception that there's some, you don't see on the city council meetings, you don't see all the, all the players that started this eight years ago, I haven't seen any of them for two years. So, I mean, it just, again, if you want to sell it, to everybody and they say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they, yeah, I mean, it's just better if, uh, yeah, some statistics. Yeah, well, with the call center, it seems like you could start to at least get those statistics. Yeah, that's and right. yeah. Good to show that is one of the advantages of the call center. Yeah. That is a big yeah. advantage. Of course, by then, it's already too late. <laughs> um, let me finish, let me just finish with this comment. Um, uh, I've been saying this for a year. Uh, the whole year I've been, a little more than a year I've been here. Land use is always hard. There's nothing easy about doing land use because you're dealing with people's pocketbooks and you're dealing with where they live. And people are very passionate about that. I've said this many times, if we could add children into this, we'd have the nuclear bomb of all issues because those are the three things that people really get very passionate about. Um, and so when we look at what is success in developing land use policies, what you'll find in this is something Everyone will find something they absolutely love. They will also find something they absolutely hate. Okay? Um, the question really is, the home run for the city is, can you and can we as a city live with what is being proposed? If we can come by and if we can come and finish this and say we can live with this, um, then we've hit a home run. We've done very well. In language, because again, there's nothing easy about language. The other part of it is, is that cities are not static; they grow. They're living things that change, and so I'm, I'm often asked, when will we be done with BRD with BRDs? And my answer is never, because you'll come back and address this in three to five years again, and we should come back and address it in three to five years. Just like we address and look at our master plans and our other planning documents. Uh, and that the reason is cities are just living entities that change and grow and, and as, as we all change and grow. And then people come in, people leave, and so forth. So when we look at uh, how well we have done when all of this is eventually done, for, for me, a success is can we live with what has been? Uh, can we as a city live with it? And so with that, um, again, please, any comments, send it to that email address. If you have any questions, feel free to call either Richard or me. We're happy to answer those. I'll probably uh, also direct you again to sending in the email address. I just can't stress enough how important it is to get that input from you. We have two more of these presentations next week. Tuesday will be at the community college at 6 o'clock. Wednesday will be here at 6 o'clock. Please pass on to your neighbors, your friends, others who might be interested to come and uh, join us as we wrap this up and then formally go into preparing the documents. Do you have an idea of the timeline? How, like how long does it usually take to you know, get these things put together once you get all the public input? There will, there's timelines that are based upon what we have to advertise because there's public hearings that will go with this and those all have time frames associated with them. The biggest, the biggest part right now in the preparation of this is Richard having the time to finish these studies. Um, and, so, um, and so he's diligently working on those and so I don't, can't really say a time frame. It will be sooner than later. One nice thing I've heard from, I think everybody, no matter where they stand, feel and what they feel about BRDs is, is that it's time for us to finish this, and, uh, and that's that's a great thing. You know, that's a good point to be at. Yeah. Are the next meetings going to cover the same subject? Yes, they'll be the same subject. So there's no point coming. No, um, and uh, and all of these, uh, each of these are being televised uh, on uh, on either the web page or channel four. Uh, so you can, you know, if you have any questions, you can go back to that. Of course, the slides are on our web page. Yes, sir. These are not considered the public hearings. No, no. Those the public hearings will come after we have prepared the actual ordinance changes. Okay. 
And am I correct to assume that the ordinances would have a period before which they would take effect? I'm just thinking about, you know, if this went into effect or was approved in, say, June, but you've got renters lined up between now and the end of the year, and there's a change in your occupancy level. We are trying to account for those. Right? Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, everybody. Sure, appreciate you coming. Can you remember?